During our course, we've enjoyed many stories about the lives and the workings of the minds of geniuses, how Einstein created mental pictures that he later put into what he called thought experiments, and how baby Einstein proved to be a fraud, why statues of female pharaoh Hatshepsut came with a fake beard, how scientists in the late 19th century believed it possible to detect genius simply by feeling the shape of people's skulls, how Marie Curie got photoshopped out of her leading role as a scientist, how Isaac Newton stuck a large needle in his eye and wiggled it around to learn about separation of colors within the color spectrum, and why and how Thomas Edison, for heaven's sakes, electrocuted an elephant. Such stories were instructive and sometimes entertaining and sometimes just plain crazy. But the point of such historical anecdotes, as is often said, is to use our knowledge of the past to do better in the future. Remember what our resident psychiatrist guest, Dr. Eileen Jennings, said in her interview toward the beginning of our course, quote, I think the point of this course is not to tell stories about interesting people in the past who do wonderful things who we now call geniuses. I think the point of this course is that we need geniuses. We need creative solutions. We need innovation. We need to fix things that are broken. Geniuses have a way of fixing things. The question here is, at the end of our course, how can we apply what we've learned so as to fix things, make things better, generally for society? What do we fix so as to, in a phrase, generate more genius? What we need to fix is our broken, wasteful system regarding the use of capital, both human and financial. First, human capital. Over the centuries, the reason we humans have come to rule the planet more than double our lifespan and lead hitherto four unimaginably rich lives is because we have the capacity to organize ourselves and to think of creative solutions to the problems that constrict our development and threaten our very existence. This capacity to fix things is human capital, and it is latent in every human being. The problem is, historically, we have had a very inefficient market with respect to human capital. The market has worked inefficiently owing to a restricted supply chain. We have restricted the participation of many potentially creative people. We have wasted, and I'm just guessing here, of course, we've wasted perhaps as much as half of our human potential if we consider the exclusion of women and minorities and the economically disadvantaged from the creative workspace. If we don't get all people into the game, then we don't get their ideas and their energies into the process of making life better. How to fix this? Well, do the obvious. Implement or enforce existing laws that mandate equal opportunity across the board, regardless of race and religion, and regardless of sexual orientation and gender. Don't typecast by gender. No more chemistry sets only for boys or kitchen sets only for girls. Have work rules that are fair for mothers, employer or government mandated childcare, parental leave and paternity as well as maternity leave with fathers using up as much leave as mothers. Obviously equal pay for equal work. Today women still only earn about 80% of male pay. These are just a couple of obvious starter ideas you yourself can fill in so many others. But the point is that such fixes will allow everyone to go to the starting line in the race toward exceptional accomplishment. But there is something else here with regard to human capital. Everyone should get to the starting line equally prepared so as to let loose that little bit of genius in all of us. Universal pre-K education, Project Head Start, again, well, these are both good places to begin. What might the, these early education programs look like? Well, don't forget our free-range barnyard 
exploration, sometimes disappointment and failure, when they're all part of it. At the other end of formal education, college or university, in many countries around the world, a university education is free to its citizens. In the United States, it is not. Here, of course, we need more government grants, such as Pell Grants, which make university fully available to the most promising students regardless of income, as well as universities offering need-blind admissions. Any qualified student can come, which exists now at some nearly 100 U.S. colleges. Also, to open the door equally to all, end legacy admissions the practice whereby children of graduates are more easily admitted to the college that their parents attended. That's not merit, that's privilege. Well, these again are just a couple of ideas as to how to begin to fix our problem, the inefficient use of human capital. We can have more geniuses in the world, fewer lost Einsteins, if we get out of our way, remove barriers, and allow the potential for the genius in all of us to come forth. But notice, there is a contradiction here, a contradiction inherent in the notion of equality and the very concept of genius, or exceptional human accomplishment. The old conundrum of equality and exceptionalism. The word exceptional, by definition, means outside the norm and thus unequal, perhaps greater or better than the rest. We need equal opportunity for all, knowing that this is the surest way to generate unequal, exceptional accomplishment that in turn can benefit us all. That's the conundrum. We also need to understand that although everyone is entitled to an equal start, the end results will not be the same. Genius, by definition, presupposes an inequality of outcome. The exceptional thoughts of an Einstein or the extraordinary music of Bach, and it generates a concomitant inequality of reward, eternal fame for Bach, fabulous wealth for Bezos. Some people simply accomplish more and thus have earned more. That obviously, again, creates inequality, a potential enemy of equality. So how to resolve the conundrum? How do we incentivize individual creativity and at the same time empower the creativity of all? Governmental policy. All of us are born with unique talents. The economic, social, and political system of a country should be fashioned so that each individual is allowed to explore their inborn talent to its fullest. But of course, the mechanism by which a country fosters universal empowerment has to be financed and is financed by one of two ways, by taxation that does not suppress innovation and creativity and by philanthropy directed toward innovation and creativity. From the notion of genius now to tax law, I'm not an economist. In tax law, I'm told by my friend Ushke Horiguchi, a former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund is one of the most complex issues in the entire field of economics. But I've run the following ideas by him and now offer them to you for your consideration. Tax point one, low taxes on corporate profits, capital gains, and personal income. They're good. That is to say, they should be no higher than the level at which they would begin to diminish incentives to work, to save, invest, and innovate. We need to provide a sensible system of incentives as well as equal opportunity for all to explore their unique inborn talent. As Hora Gerci has written, quote, this is the way the market-based economic system or capitalism is supposed to work if well designed. Communism and some types of socialism aim at equality for all in terms not only of opportunity, but also of outcome. And history has demonstrated beyond any doubt that the system dedicated to equality of outcome never works. Tax point two, low taxes on estates are bad. We should have high taxes on estates. Remember, genius is not generational. 
succeeding generations, those that come after the genius, such as the Vanderbilts or the Royals, they demonstrated, these successors usually squander the capital. They don't put it to a publicly beneficial use. So maybe instead of giving your pot of gold to your kids, give it to a creative foundation. And thus, tax point three. Tax laws that encourage philanthropy are good. In the United States, you can pay the money to the government as taxes, or you can avoid the taxes by giving it away to private creative enterprises, philanthropic foundations, including museums and universities, or to any sort of school with a nonprofit status. Let's take an example. By all recent reckonings, 80% of the world's leading universities are private universities, the large majority in the United States. They are the ones that have the best resources, both physical and human. They are the ones with the need-blind admissions, essentially a free education which has been paid for by private philanthropy. At my own institution, Yale, admission is now need-blind, and 70% of the bills of the college and the graduate school are paid by the Yale Endowment, accumulated, privately donated capital. Indeed, the program that makes possible these Yale online courses, such as the one you are engaging, free to all around the world, is funded by private capital donated for the public good. That's genius. Thus, exceptional ideas can lead to exceptional wealth. But that wealth only has value if it is given back to unleash the human capital in all of us. An efficient use of financial capital can promote an efficient use of human capital and thereby accelerate progress. Let's construct a final Einstein-like thought experiment. Imagine, if you will, a miraculous machine on a global scale with human capital, innovative ideas, generating exceptional financial capital, which comes back to Earth to generate equally more human capital in a smoothly running, endlessly synergistic, progressive cycle. The all-world genius machine. Pure genius. Thank you for engaging.